welcome to uh, psychotherapy question time. We have a very simple question to talk about for this session. Uh, as just been mentioned, how can our society ensure that high quality psychotherapies are available to all those uh, who need them? If you're wondering why uh, that title was chosen, I'm told that in your latest membership survey, 87% of members said that one of the most important activities that the UK Council for Psychotherapy should undertake on their behalf was to ensure that the highest quality and range of psychotherapies is made available to all. And 90% of you said that the Council should improve public understanding of psychotherapy and psychotherapeutic counselling. So you've clearly asked for this one. Um, so fortunately we have four guests with us who can hopefully throw a tremendous amount of light on the subject. A little more detail about them. From the left they are Paul Burstow, a Professor of Mental Health Public Policy at the University of Birmingham, uh, Chair of uh, Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust and Honorary Professor of Health and Social Care at City uh, University of London. As well as that, MP for Sutton and Cheam for 18 years until 2015 uh, and a former Minister in the Department of Health uh, developing the government's uh, mental health policy, no health without mental health. Uh, Jenny Edwards, who's uh, the chief executive of the Mental Health Foundation, which has been pioneering uh, changes in public mental health for 65 years. Uh, she's described by one of her former employees, didn't know I got this, did you? Um, as one of those chief executives you really want to follow, full of passion and purpose, and one of those people who really changes our society for the better. Andrew Samuels is a former um, UKCP chair. He's a co-founder of uh, Psychotherapists and Counselors for Social Responsibility and also of the Alliance for Counseling and Psychotherapy. Andrew Samuels has been working as a therapist and analyst for more than 40 years. He's a professor of analytical psychology at Essex University, as well as holding visiting chairs at New York, London, Roehampton, and Macau universities. And uh, Judith Lask is uh, a family, couple, and individual systemic psychotherapist. Um, trainer, supervisor, consultant, and uh, member. So I think that covers most people and most skills. She was chair of the Association for Family Therapy for four years and on LinkedIn has been endorsed for her psychotherapy skills by many people, including An um, Adam Lask. Related by any chance? Yeah, he, may be he may be. He may be a son. So, uh, so endorsed by her son. <laughs> that has to work well, doesn't it? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, your panel. There we are, your panel. Reminder of the question, how can our society ensure that high-quality psychotherapies are available to all those who need them? Uh, to get the ball rolling, though, let's hear from each of our panel members. Uh, we've offered them three minutes each to uh, lay out their stall, uh, their views. I'm going to be relatively strict on that. So let's start, then. Um, three minutes, if you would. Uh, Paul, would you like to get the ball rolling with the thoughts okay. you'd like to be grilled on short. Okay, um, well thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and I think what I wanted to do was sort of apply a, a campaigner's lens to answering this question and uh, start with a, a slogan which is uh, drummed into the heads of many standing for elected office which is uh, don't leave it up to others, others may be leaving it up to you and therefore this question is fundamentally about who is the you in this and I think it's all of you and many outside this room who actually have to be part of a social movement that is committed to driving these sorts of changes. Um, the uh, American cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead has a very well-worn and used phrase, which I suspect has been put on many slides over the years, but never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Now, I think there's one word missing from that very powerful sentiment, and that's the word organising and organised. Uh, you can have all of the evangelists, the mavericks, the contrarians, the disruptors in the world, but if there is no agreed platform, no common cause that is being worked towards, then an awful lot of energy will translate into an awful lot of heartache and not a lot of delivery. So I think there are three conditions to answering this question and realising what the UKCP membership want to achieve, and they really come under three Cs. The first is one I think your chair has been talking about today, which is the importance of collaboration across those that share a common set of ideas and insights into uh, the human condition and how we approach it. Uh, and making common cause with others is an important part of that. The second is to communicate powerful stories told by those with lived experience, powerful stories told by those that are practitioners, 
And those stories need to be told repeatedly, in volume, over time. Because until you are bored of telling those stories, they won't have got out of this room and they won't have resonated with anyone else. And I think the story that Susie uh, just told about that sense of a safe place where she could have that conversation and that rewriting of her script, of her story, and that desire to heal and thrive really is an important emotional way of connecting and moving uh, this agenda forward. And it is a way in which you connect with politicians and get change. And the third is the importance of being contemporary. Um, and I know this from the point of view of the trust that I chair, the Tavistock and Portman, the importance of being contemporary. And we do that in the work that we do in the family court service with the family drug and alcohol court service, translating long established ideas and principles into different settings and actually enabling families to stay together and getting much better results for all parts of the system, but primarily for the child and the family. And our primary care psychological consultation services, which are not just there for people with medically unexplained symptoms, but actually are of benefit to the whole practice okay. in terms of addressing their needs. And to conclude, I think it is about being contemporary, it is about collaborating, and it is about communicating, preferably in three minutes. Paul, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Only five seconds, Sarah. Right? <laughs> Jenny, all yours. Yeah, I'm going to stand up because I like to wave my hand around when I speak. Um, I'm going to call on you to make sure there is enough access to psychological therapies by looking at the demand side as well as the supply side. So I'm calling on you to become part of a prevention revolution in mental health. Now, take, for example, our panel as representative of the UK population, which we're probably not, but bear with me. <laughs> so, Judith and Andrew, um, let's say you are the thriving people. Susie has talked about thriving, not just surviving. Great, but you need that mental health literacy, that psychologist magazine, and that all of you will be bringing to other people who are not specialists in your conversation about what mental health is. It's often eye-opening for people to hear mental health does not not equal mental illness and that there's something that we can do about our mental health. Just getting that out there is important. Now say Paul is not thriving, he's sort of surviving, but actually he's not, he's not ill. He needs something that makes sure he does move into the thriving camp and there are things that he can do to improve his mental health, you know, take those walks, do that mindfulness, go and listen to great concerts, socialise with friends, all those things we know help us become stronger and be, and be more able to cope with the tough things in lives. Now, if I'm the person, the other 25%, who actually has got a diagnosable level of mental ill health, what are my chances of getting to one of you or to getting help? We know only one in four people. So odds are I won't be getting help. And even if we double the amount of um, funding going in, the amount of help there, or treble it, we'd have to quadruple it to make sure that I got help. And we still wouldn't be reaching people like Paul who would be here the next, next week or next month along. So we have to get into prevention. And that means we have to be talking and intervening way beyond health services. We have to be where people are, in our communities, in our schools, in our workplaces, and increasingly that other place we all are. Are, particularly our kids, which is in the online environment. That's where we can get messages out, and it's where we know their answers are around the world. Paul and I have just been at an international conference last week, got, last week, got lots of great ideas about that, so do ask about it in the question time. But I'm going to stop there and say, please join that prevention revolution. Jenny, thank you very much. Andrew, your three minutes. How many minutes? Three. That was oh. two and a half, by the way. So there's three. <laughs> if society wanted to ensure that high-quality psychotherapy was available to all, it would have done it. Rather than destroying what was there already, we've seen a decimation of real, relational, depth psychotherapy in the name of austerity, neoliberalism, and a fetishization of the so-called evidence base. So I have varied the question to ask, what can organizations like UKCP do? Three things. One, UKCP not needs to stop worrying so much about regulation and move into a much more assertive and committed campaigning mode. Let's abandon the deference shown to the powerful in government, 
even if we lose access to cups of tea in Whitehall and Westminster. In connection with deference, it's interesting to see how the big five therapy organizations, including UKCP, have been moved by the activities of smaller organizations to take a position of more open challenge to the DWP on the linkage of benefits, sanctions, work, and therapy, which is a total and disgusting scandal. <laughs> Deduct it from the three. <laughs> second, second, let's think a little bit about NICE and IAPT, and for the Americans, I'll explain the acronyms later. Nice and IAPT, it is more than a question of challenging them as institutions or ideologies. We have to realize that this is about, has always been about, and will always be about people's status, power, and influence, including ours. There is a battle for the soul going on. We have to get down and dirty in that battle. We may lose. Indeed, we are losing. One important point, be very careful not to let a few examples of high quality psychotherapy in the odd one or two IAPs distract us from the awful reality of that service. It is still a second class service for people deemed to be second class citizens. Third and last, we need to transform therapy, we need to transform ourselves. So that therapy thinking enters more difficult discourses, discourses other than the obvious ones, education, mental health, parenting, personal growth. I'm thinking of class, economics, war, violence, racial and other prejudices, climate change, oppression and inequality generally. If we want to transform therapy, we also need to attend to our awful problems of a lack of diversity and equalities in our profession, which you can see in the audience in this very room. This okay. is a social responsibility and social justice question. And in summary, five words. One, no more arse licking. Two, fully engage in the battle for the soul. Three, transform ourselves as well. Thank you. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. That last bit was actually 13 words, I counted, but never mind. Uh, but anyway, lots of ideas thrown out for you there to pick up on. And uh, Judith, all yours. Well, Andrew and I will disagree on one or two points. Um, I think we have to think of psychotherapy as part of the whole community of therapies and interventions available in the mental health field. And um, I think, therefore, as psychotherapists, we need to work to improve things in general and not just focus on psychotherapy in particular, although the message descriptions of that have to get out there very clearly. The case is already made for the importance of mental health and the way it affects every bit of our society's working and every bit of people's lives, health, employment, poverty, they're all related to levels of mental health. Uh, the importance of prevention and early intervention and work with children and families has also been made. The case has been made also for the long-standing lack of ambition that society has had around mental health. And young minds have reminded us that if we had the same sort of targets for physical health conditions as mental health conditions, then there would be a big outcry. Um, so my first point really is there needs to be more cross-party, cross-department collaboration about mental health. We need to take the long view. It won't all be done in one session of Parliament and it won't all be done in one generation. We have to have a long view. There are glimmers of hope. Mental health is talked about more. I don't think things have gone totally downhill. I think there are a lot of things that are better than they were. It is a focus of government policy, and there's more money going into some services, for instance, transformation of CAMs. It will need a great deal of effort from all of us to keep these things, emerging things, growing and developing and to build on them. 
And one of the things the government should do immediately is ring-fence the mental health budget because it gets sucked into the abyss of cuts and so on and doesn't get used. Um, I mean, there, there are, as an important element is the range and um, of provision of psychotherapies. And we know that there's been a lot going into the sort of slightly shorter, more focused um, interventions, which are very important and useful and, and definitely have a big place. Not everybody is going to access psychotherapy. But one of the problems is assessment has been put in the hands of the least qualified people rather than the most qualified people. So it means that people go round in circles and never get the real help that they, that they need from an early stage. And I think that definitely has to be changed. We need to increase the accessibility, as been already um, mentioned, and that's geographical, but also about being able to speak to the whole of our population, not to just a few privileged bits of it, and okay, Andrew Judith. covered that point. All right. I finish now? Yes. Can I just say one thing? Two, two things. One, th one, is, no, two. <laughs> one is that we have to keep on with our research base, and we have to become evidence informed rather than evidence-based, because that just falls into the trap of the way the research money flows. Okay, let's hold it on that. Yeah, Other it. thoughts I'm sure you can weave into your yeah, answers indeed. as the questions come flooding in from the floor. Well done, thank you. <laughs> Anybody? Uh, there you are. Uh, uh, would you like to get the ball rolling, first of all? Justin can come to you. Just a, uh, a comment, really. I don't think it's a question... Um... I just feel um, I need to uh, express uh, my experience of working in the NHS um, as a psychotherapist. And um, I would consider myself as a, 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 a it's a privilege. And I, 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 I guess I would see myself as um, working on grassroots level. And I think um, I'm not defending IAPT, but I think um, we have to take a measured view and we have to also see the positive side of IAPT, mm -hmm. which is that it uh, allows people at grassroots level to access therapy and get a taste of therapy. And I certainly like to uh, consider myself as doing some important and useful work uh, contributing to um, mental health uh, in, in West London. Um, I think uh, there are ways uh, in which we can use, we, we can measure in, a, in an intelligent way um, that is useful. So I don't, I don't think we should um, throw the baby out of the bath. Does anybody just want to throw any thoughts off the back of that before we move on to some questions? Jenny? Yeah, th um, just that I heard something quite interesting um, from one of the health commissioners in Australia last week about their version, which is access to allied psychological services, which gives people in general a right to 12 sessions of a whole range of different types of psychological support and potentially another six as well. It's access through their GPs and through a mental health plan. He was saying his wife is a GP and it had completely transformed her appreciation of mental health and the ways in which people could be supported. So I think, um, I, though I'm not, by no means an expert on it. It's certainly there are other models out there that could be looked at and compared to what we have and could be a development of where we are at the moment in the UK. Okay, thanks Jenny. Let's take our first actual question on the front row. But I want to hear from the panel, especially for you, Andrew, how do we do it? Let's, let's, let's look at the economic reality. We are a small band considering mental health in numbers and in political power and political acumen. So how do we do it? Show us the way. Somebody show us the way. Who would like to pick up on that? The well, way I, think, Judith. I think you're absolutely right. And I, I, I think we need to point out that psychotherapy hasn't done a very good job, even, with it, even if one looks at the private practice clientele in terms of covering the country, um, being flexible, making it more accessible. To people. So I think we haven't done a good, good job, and I don't think we can work alone, and I don't think we can think of only promoting psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is great. 
It, it, it works to change the way we position ourselves, we see the world, the way we're differently in relationship to things. But not everybody is that right for or they have the time for. But if we have a society that's more aware of those values, that's the beginning point. And then I think we have to go, yeah, for the general stuff and the information, but also for some specific policies that we know are damaging. But what we mustn't do is whine. That's what we mustn't do. OK, um, panel, if you want to plunge in, do. I know Paul wants to. In fact, I think you all want to. Paul. Yeah, I was just going to reiterate what I said in my three minutes, which is I think that part of this is about working out who you can make alliances with. It is about working out the platform you want to communicate. It is um, about making sure that you are working with others. And I think part of uh, the messages you've heard already from the platform, due to this point about the, the importance really around looking at uh, the gap between what is available and what is delivered and how that is so different when it comes to physical health. I think that's part of the message. And I think the challenge you've had about this prevention revolution, the reality is that to try and meet the close the treatment gap simply by scaling up existing treatment offers to the scale that will be necessary. We will never find enough people to be able to do that. So we do have, and this is an increasing issue within physical health services as well. So we have to start thinking about what we can do upstream. In other words, there's alliances to be made with the epidemiologists, looking at the causes of the causes, which in many ways are part of the insights that what you are about are about. So I think there's a, there's a whole set of alliances to be made here uh, to, to make this message more powerful. Thank you. Andrew? Well, the question was asked to me. I'll just say a very few things. We, the, the leadership of UKCP and the other organizations need to consider angling their campaign towards more of a restoration of what there was, for example, counseling in GP practices, because we all know that what has happened has been a dismantling of something which, while not perfect, was better than what we have. Second, on the question of rhetoric, we should use rhetoric, but make sure it's good rhetoric, and the rhetoric I want to use, and I would use if I was chair, would be, we don't want a class system imported into psychotherapy where working class people get IAPT, IAPT workers, Get therapy from UKCP members. This is wrong. Lastly, you need to look at who is talking. I have learned when my colleagues in this profession talk to see who is in fact working for the government or for establishment structures. You can work that out by looking at the biographies of the panel. Okay. It's a very important, sorry to say it, it's a nasty thing to say, but look at who is talking and who is paying them. All right, there's some homework for you. Uh, Jenny. Yes, um, I think in order to change what's happening in our society, we need to look at different levels. So we've been talking earlier about individuals, but we also have community level and national level. Um, as one of a group of six charities who work together lobbying government on mental health, um, at national level, we have spoken to people like Paul and Norman and ministers. We, with the change of government, we... Go into, we've been invited into number 10 more. We get the sense that they're trying to do something different, but they don't quite know what it is at the moment. So sort of doors are open, but we have to have focused answers to it. But I'd also say let's not ignore local level. We know local government is feeling very disempowered and has been hugely cut back, but actually it's in our communities, particularly those that have the greatest disadvantage, that we can both find out most and represent what's happening in people's lives lives and make differences and uh, an asset-based approach is really important. We must remember that a lot of knowledge and so social support and solidarity is there in communities and not assume it's all going to be done through policy papers. Jenny, thank you very much indeed. Uh, a number of questions coming in now so I won't necessarily come to the whole panel for every question mm -hmm. but here's one. Thank you. Um, I think one of the failures we have in our profession is to focus on the profession, who we are inside, all our internal questions. And it isn't about us, and it isn't about the healthcare system, it is about people who need us. How do we paint the picture of who needs us in a believable way? I wonder if members can give me a picture of the people who need us so someone will listen. Jenny's nodding. Yeah. Um, 
people spring to mind as you say that that um, my organisation has worked with. We, we don't provide services. We do sort of demonstration projects. And recently, we've had a programme running with single parents in the very poor estates in Cardiff and Newport. Um, and one of the women who took part in that um, was agoraphobic. She wouldn't leave her house without her daughter going with her because she'd experienced domestic violence and her ex's family were really persecuting her. She couldn't use her mobile phone because she was hearing from them and her own family all the time. She felt besieged. And she did come along with her daughter to this group, which was about solidarity, self-management, and so on. And people showed her different things she could do with her mobile phone. And within a month, um, having turned off those things, she was able to come out of her house on her own. And I just think that was a real life-changing thing for her. It didn't involve masses of deep psychotherapy in that case, but it does show that people's lives can be changed by the right interventions. And Paul. Yeah, I was just going to give an example as well. I think you're right. We do have to talk in terms of stories and we have to paint a picture of who, who we're, we're trying to, to work with to support. And I would give the example of, again, there are places where in primary care there are still services being provided by uh, psychotherapists uh, in uh, City and Hackney and in... Uh, Camden, there are services that wrap around those practices. They provide support to the practice, which is incredibly important in terms of dealing with the stresses and strains of being in a very high-pressured open access service. But also they're working with some of the most complicated uh, individuals who are presenting uh, in many parts of our healthcare system, providing them support which is making a difference in their lives. So I think we need to be talking about the benefits that uh, having a psychotherapeutic approach, a psychosocial understanding uh, to, to people's needs, uh, can bring to a otherwise overly dominated medical model of health. Thank you. Something in that for you? Was there something you pulled out of that? Uh, yes, there was. And, and Jenny in particular, thank you. That kind of story is, is essential, it seems to me. And I hope we start focusing on them when we take our messages. Lovely. Thank you. Um, picking up on Paul's uh, first C, I think it was collaboration, uh, we do live in neoliberal times. When I uh, first started training, I worked in the third sector, but I didn't get paid. Um, but the uh, service did get paid by uh, local government. So my question really is how we can get some sort of collaboration between state, private and third sector on the money. Not an easy one. Who'd like to take that? Paul, do you it want to start was, off on that? It was directed at mm. me, um, so I'm much happier if someone else was given it first. Um, <laughs> Jenny's given an example from Australia, which I think is interesting, because the, the model that they have in Australia, which is about opening access to a range of uh, therapeutic interventions, is a pay-for-service pay independent contractor model, um, but within the framework of a publicly funded system. Um, and of course, if we go back to the founding of the NHS, there, were one, there was one part of our professional groups that did retain an independent fee-for-service contractor arrangement. It was our GPs. Um, everyone else lost that. I'm not certain that replicating the Australian model into ours would necessarily be the solution. But I think we do need to work ways in which we can gain access to a wider marketplace of uh, therapeutic uh, interventions. I just wanted to offer one other thought, though, which is actually um, something from the history of, of, of the Tavistock and the points at which it and the people that have been in its history throughout have been most effective. And they've been at points of change in our society, points of disruption in our society, whether that was in the post-First World War period or in the post-Second World War period. I think we're in another period of disruption. This neo-Trumpism uh, that we are seeing it is, and the anger that sits behind that, which reflects itself in the, the votes we've had both here and uh, in America, I think are an opportunity, not just a threat, for many of the insights and approaches that this organisation embodies, and certainly uh, my organisation embodies too. And Andrew, brief thought from you. Uh, this is not another uh, 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 ideological rant. This is a, <laughs> intended as a thoughtful observation for the psychotherapists in this room who are, in my view, being lost. We, I'm not sure how really psychotherapy is 
a mental health activity in the traditional sense or a health activity. You know what I mean? I don't think we're in the diagnosis and cure business at all. This is how we learn in our trainings to think about working with the client, not imposing a diagnostic category on the client. And I just am a bit worried with the way the conversation is going, that it might be missing our thoughtfulness, which is very different from what mental health and its values are, are all about. I imagine many of you here know what I'm, what I'm referring to. I'm not saying we shouldn't seek all kinds of collaborations with all kinds of people, but let's just not forget what we do. But I think Andrew, quite... thank you. Uh, I'm Could... going to move on if I may. Okay. Let me come, come back to you in, in a moment if I may. Uh, I am looking for hands everywhere. There's a few up there. Oh, we, we see raise them now, but we have our next question there. Uh, how has UKCP done in regard to interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary uh, interventions across, from psycho, across psychotherapy to other disciplines in view of race culture that we've got, in, that we, which is a burning issue for all of us today. Okay, your view on that, Andrew? It's incredibly difficult to collaborate and work cooperatively with the very people one is committed to critiquing and opposing this is very difficult for the leadership of an organization like UKCP. The Department of Work and Pensions is a good example. The level of critique of dissociation, I mean disassociation, not the psychological state, it's not to do with us, is very high, very articulate and very cogent. And yet, as the chair and uh, officers know, there's a need to work with these people. Now, I don't have a solution to chuck out from here, but it is very difficult to work with people whose ideology is completely foreign to ours. Judith. It might be difficult, but I think it's absolutely essential. And I am going back to our first presentation of the day in which we we're hearing about left brain and right brain and how it isn't that one's better than the other or one is in opposition to the other, but it's about them working together in, in a balance. And I think psychotherapy has some amazing values and ideas, but there are amazing values and ideas in all sorts of places. And we need to collaborate. We need to work together. This doesn't need to be a fight, actually. It's not going to be a revolution in the streets. It's going to be a revolution through human caring and compassion. All right. Very quickly, Jenny. Yes. Yes. Um, I think mm. this is a really crucial question, actually. We, we know, and we've recently put information out about the high levels of anxiety that people feel mm. around what is coming in every day in the headlines to them, mm. and particularly people who may have felt um, a sense of belonging before and are now feeling sort of cast out, or people are seizing the moment to release their prejudices. I think this is very traumatizing for people, um, and that we have to be very alert to put um, our, our own input on another side to that to say actually no we are all in this together we're not going to be divided in that way but I'd throw in the potential role of one of my past sectors which is the arts I think the arts and culture have an enormous potential role for helping to tell the story that is a much more healing and unifying one of who we are and how we live and to tell the story of what people are experiencing particularly when there's an intersection of poverty and discrimination other things hitting people, not in a way that necessarily provokes sympathy, because that is a bit alienating as well, but provokes empathy and a feeling that could happen to us. And I, I am a bit disappointed in my sort of former colleagues in the arts that we haven't seen enough of that yet. And I think if people have those cultural connections, then please encourage people really to tell what people are experiencing now. We have to feel again what we felt you know, some decades before, or certainly in post-war, that actually we had been through tough times together and that we did want to help our brothers and sisters, even if they were living a different lives to ourselves. Jenny, thank you. Sorry for trying to rush you. It's an, it is an important issue. We have a question from the balcony. Hello, from the balcony. Um, <laughs> I am a self-employed therapist, okay? I work in a small practice. I see a limited number of clients. In terms of working collaboratively, and I'm interested from your point of view of the panel, in terms of working collaboratively, 
my opportunity to do that is very limited. I see clients, I earn money to pay my way, I have children. Um, I'm a self-employed person struggling with all the needs of being self-employed whilst keeping my training up. And so in terms of reaching out collaboratively, it all sounds very fine. But what I want to actually be able to do is find a way to resource, to help individuals who are on a long waiting list, don't feel that they can afford therapy, have partners or husbands or wives that just want them to click a finger and get fixed. And I wonder how, what your thoughts are for people like me who are, you know, jobbing psychotherapists, can I call myself? Judith, I feel you feeling that one. <laughs> yes, well, I think it's, it's difficult. I've worked most of my life in the NHS and um, have felt that I could operate as a psychotherapist fairly well and have really enjoyed the vast array of people that I've, that I've worked with. I think it isn't possible to get in there now so easily sort of as a part-time psychotherapist to supplement what you're doing. And I think maybe that's where being in private practice, there could be collaboration between psychotherapists to enable there to be some low cost therapy. Organizations such as MIND are um, you know, offering some psychotherapy in their centers and they're often looking for people to do that. You won't earn a lot of money doing that because the point is that a lot of people you might want to reach out to haven't got a lot of money to, to spend. But that, that's what I'd say. I'm not in a position to be able to offer voluntary mm. because I work for myself. Mm. And yet, if there was more support from government, from GPs, from services like that, then I would be able to reach out towards people. But actually, it's really asking me to what? Supplement through my husband's income for me to be able to offer voluntary. But I would like to be able to help more people. And so I feel government or the organisation should be thinking in terms of that so that it isn't an elite, well-off therapy base and anybody else can kind of be down. <laughs> I was going to come to Andrew, um, he's just going to agree. Simple as that, isn't it? From your point of view, I suspect. I'll just say one thing. Yeah. The, the attacks on real depth psychotherapy in the public sector are having implications for private practice. Now, this is not quite the topic of the panel, but it's something that people here need, they know all about. And what this woman has been saying is well, is well known. It's not just that something is happening in the, the NHS, it's changing in the private sector as well. There's a sea change away from what we do. All right. And the question is, is UKCP, which is, actually, we know, UKCP is, I believe, going to engage with that, right? Okay, let's, uh, thank you for that. I'm going to bring Paul in briefly. We've not heard from Paul for a while. Uh, we've just got sort of five or ten minutes left and I want to get to as many questions as we can, but Paul. Yeah, it just comes back to my point, really, about being clear what, what the platform is you're standing on. Um, because if you try and be... Uh, all things to all of your members and therefore please everyone in the room, you'll please no one, you'll deliver nothing and you'll be having this debate year after year after year about how you get society to do something you through your surveys have said you want to happen. The thing that strikes me so far from some of these comments has been that you're not clear in your own minds in terms of how you've articulated this what it is you really mean by society increasing access to high quality uh, psychological services of the sort that you offer. Are you really meaning that it's something that is available on a fee-for-service basis? Or are you really meaning that you want to have a different relationship with the NHS? I'm not clear, and I think if I'm not clear, then it's important that you are clear, because if you want to deliver a message, if you want to move politicians, if you want to move this forward, then that clarity is absolutely essential. All right, I noticed his questions. He's asked you a question. One, one 20 second view from somebody. Can you just, Justin, can you just whiz down for a second for this lady here? I would like to know whether you think it's got to be work with or against the government, because the way I understand it is that's where the money trickles down or floods down in, in better times. It goes to the NHS, it goes to local governments, it goes to all sorts of agencies. And I'm speaking as a person who's um, starting out in private practice, but also volunteering for free at MIND, because MIND can't pay, they, they can't pay anything now. 
you know, the work that's done at MIND in terms of counselling or psychotherapy All right. is mostly done for free. Thank you for that. So, so that's the level we're at now. It is a question in the end. Do we work with or against the government? Uh, Jenny? Yes, I think it comes back to actually to what Susie was saying. There are certain things that we can't change, but we can change ourselves. So um, there are things that we can do, because the government doesn't touch everything, but it's there. But actually, one of the things that's very good for our mental health is to feel that we can, through unity with others, actually influence. But then that requires that collaboration, negotiation over what is the single thing that we all share that we're going to change. So a bit of both. Sometimes you're going to be with them because they're there and you want to make it work. And other times you're going to say, in the right way, I hope using all your professional insights, you're going to communicate, um, actually, you've got to do things differently and we'll help you do it because that always makes people more inclined to say yes. Paul, do you have 30 seconds of insight in that from your background? It, 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 is, it is with and against and uh, there are clearly some areas where absolutely you have to be campaigning and demonstrating and being very clear why what is being proposed. The, 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 the coercive approach to benefits and mental health absolutely is an area where there is no... Uh, doubt that you have to be against and be very clear about it. Um, but there are other areas where you look for the opportunities. And the, the insights around the importance and centrality of relationships is a very important part of public policy. It's getting a greater hearing now than it has for many years. And that's an area where I think there's an opportunity and doors are opening and doors could be open further. And I think the UKCP and others need to be working with those that already have got through those doors. Tavistock relationships, Tavistock and Portman are having those discussions, how we actually take some of those learnings forward. All right, let's see if we can fit two or three more questions in. Why don't all the hands go up? Uh, gentlemen, there has been waiting. Uh, my, my background is a uh, sociology graduate at a time when professionalism was a bit of a dirty word uh, about restriction of access and status. Uh, my lifetime's work was trade union campaigning, which I did not belong, I did not need to belong to a profession. I'm wondering if uh, the whole idea of professionalisation uh, in the psychotherapy uh, arena parallels the growth of neoliberalism in Western society. Follow the money, as they said in the Watergate situation. Nearly all the extra money that the governments of the day have put into psychological therapies has gone in one way or another to IAPTS. I haven't got the figures to hand, but I've seen them and they're well known. We need to push back on that. By all means, continue to fund IAPS if that is really what is considered the best thing to do. But does it have to suck up every last pound of extra money that is available? And I have to say, I agree with you completely when you talk about provision of psychological services because that is what attracts Whitehall attracts the politicians. We are not really providing that kind of psychological service. We're providing something that is cheap, effective, and a social good, and it should be funded, and that is the argument we need to go on making ever more assertively. Thank you. Does that answer, does that deal with your question to an extent? Yep, fine. All right, thank you very much indeed. And a question next to me. I think there's a issue of education within society to address the psychotherapy kind of uh, idea. On one side of things, you've got UKCP, BACP, who in my head are quite heavy handed. If you say to someone, oh, you should see a therapist, it's like, oh, I've got six, 12, 18 months of, of dealing with this. On the other side of things, I'm interested in the panel's opinion of uh, <coughs> avenues like Mental Health First Aid England, who have courses where they're going to uh, universities, businesses, etc. two-day courses and then refer to other professionals. And I'm wondering if that might be an avenue forward. Yeah. Jenny. Um, I've just um, heard a, a, a wonderful story actually from Philadelphia where they've spent 10 years gradually learning um, in their public health about mental health in communities because they started with very much a treatment model um, it's one of the most deprived um, communities in, in the States, with big racial divisions, big, uh, huge amount of poverty. And they recognize as they 
they needed people to recover in communities, that they had to work with communities to support those people. Then they recognised the huge level of trauma and psychological stress in those communities. And over that time, um, as well as saving lots of money and reducing crisis demands, um, they've actually worked with churches, with um, Latino groups, with Afro-American groups, they've used the arts and culture in a big way, they have a very light touch screening process, and so that, that all those communities are gradually through those trusted bodies who they relate to every day, they are learning about mental health and they are learning about early signs, about supporting each other and about not needing, um, do I need therapy or not? It's a, whole, it's a question of a whole graded degree of support that's there peer-to-peer, -peer, within families, within neighbourhoods. And I think that absolutely has to be the direction we move in. And as we're working with um, the Mayor of London in Thrive London, we're devising some community-led training programmes. I think we have to tap into the assets of our families and communities and social networks because that's, at the end of the day, that is where we get our support. We get some hours each year from the professionals and sometimes that's really needed but we absolutely need the rest to be as strong as possible. I'm going to go for one more question because you raised your hand a long time ago. Uh, probably final question. Okay, um, I'd like to know whether the panel thinks UKCP could be more strategic in its approach in terms of how it lobbies, how it campaigns, how it delivers ultimately a slightly different shape of psychological services. I don't hear of the UKCP working at uh, regional levels, influencing public health debates in councils about where the money should go for longer term benefit. I understand the need for a bottom up narrative that becomes increasingly powerful, but equally it needs to be dovetailed with something else in terms of the evidence of inequalities in health and what needs to be addressed. And when you say more strategic, do you mean it's more sort of hit and miss and mainly miss at the moment? Is this what you're saying? I fear so, particularly as money's getting tighter and tighter. We have to spend the money nationally more wisely, but we can't always influence government at the national level. Can we influence them at a regional or local level? Okay, so for understandable reasons, but there we are. Who'd like to pick up on that? Some thoughts from Judith. Yeah, I think that um, UKCP isn't being as broadly strategic as I would certainly like it to be. And I think, although the current collaboration is a great one, it is about psychotherapy. And I think that we need to get other providers of mental health provision and interventions working with us so we can work to the whole range of things that are available to people. And very central to all of this has to be the people who use the services. Um, I was recently on an e eating disorders curriculum, CYP, IAPT committee, and we have service, they've involved service users very well in that whole project. And the young people were saying, look, sometimes we just need to talk. We just need to be able to stay with our feelings and we need to be able to understand them. All these interventions like CBT and so on are great and they help, but sometimes we need something else. And I think if we let the people talk, they might be able to articulate this much better than us and in a way that will be listened to more. All right, Judith, thank you very much indeed. Uh, obviously taking that one on board and feeling there, is a, there are challenges ahead. Uh, thank you for your questions. Mm -hmm. We started a little later, I finished a little later, but let's just, if I can, just go for literally 60 seconds from each of you. We, knew, we know the, what the overall question was. You put your thoughts out. Thoughts have come back from the audience. Uh, let's just hear a final, as I say, a final minute from each of you. I won't start with you, Judith, which I was going to because you've just spoken. Andrew, do you want to pick up and start on this one for 60 seconds? If I was chair of UKCP still, I would be very worried because what's happening is that the question about psychotherapy, which is actually on the panel, on the banner for the conference, is in danger not of being hijacked, but of being submerged into a general question about mental health and psychological provision. Mm -hmm. Now, mental health and psychological provision is, of course, jolly important. But within the spectrum of mental health and psychological provision, there is a very special line in the spectrum called psychotherapy and counseling. The hard thing to do is to keep your eye on that ball and not let people who have 
a sort of think tank mentality, who think like government departments, take it away from us. What we have to offer is quite beautiful and it works. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. We ask for your views. We got them. <laughs> Judith, your final view. Yeah, I'm just going to perhaps mention the importance of the messages of psychotherapy getting into society because I do feel it's a holistic thing and everybody's involved. You know, if we could get out into society two messages, one that maybe people could speak to their children instead of looking at their mobile phones, especially on the bus, which I observe a lot. And secondly, that you allow your children to say that life is negative and to express their bad feelings and not jolly them up. If we did that for a generation, we would have much happier, more flexible people who would make us a much better society than we're likely to have. Judith, thank you very much indeed. Jenny. Um, I take the word, the, the C word, collaboration, that Paul started with um, as being a real invitation to invite everyone involved in um, the council to take part in Mental Health Awareness Week, which is the 8th to the 14th of May, and it's actually on the theme of thriving, not just surviving. And I think from your knowledge and experience and insights and your work, you've got a great deal that you can contribute to that, um, and I hope you'll join in. All right, thank you very much, Dude. And uh, Paul, remembering, you know, the question we were asking was, was about, about how do we get high-quality psychotherapies available to everybody, but Paul, your, your final thought on this one. Um, my, my final couple of thoughts are that um, simply railing against things seldom of itself transforms things. And I think what you have to do is be very clear about the lessons you can draw from the success politically of IAPT and see how those lessons translate into the things that you want to achieve. And I think that is something I would take away. And I think being clear and clarifying the messages that you want to communicate to politicians and other actors in the system at all sorts of levels is an essential part of that. So I agree very much with the sort of powerful messages that Judith was talking about. And I think it's really important that one of the things organizations like you do is provide space and the infrastructure and support for the voice of lived experience, because that often mm -hmm. is the way to make change happen and certainly get an opportunity to speak to power and make change happen. Paul, thank you very much indeed. It's getting warm. There's a few personal fans going here. Thank you for your questions. Sorry we couldn't get around them all in the end. I hope we spotted them as soon as the hands went up. Anyway, thank you. And can we thank uh, Judith Lask, Andrew Samuels, Jenny Edwards, and Paul Burstow, our panel, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.